first lesson comes from Psalm 25 and is a response in reading. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and the Lord. Lord. Never teach the sinners in the way. The humble guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, such as he and his covenants and his testimonies. The second lesson is from Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And the third lesson is from the Gospel of Mark. On the Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through a, field, through a grain field, his disciples began breaking off the heads of wheat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, They shouldn't be doing that. It's against the law to work by harvesting wheat on the Sabbath. But Jesus replied, Haven't you read the scriptures in the scriptures what King David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and ate the special bread reserved for priests alone. And then he gave some to his companions. That was breaking the law too. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made to benefit people, not people to benefit the Sabbath. And I, the Son of Man, am master even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went to the synagogue and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, his enemies watched him closely. Would he heal the man's hand on the Sabbath? If he did, they planned to condemn him. Jesus said to the man, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Is it good to do good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day, or is it a day for doing harm? Is the Sabbath a day to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Jesus looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. Then he said to the man, Stretch forth your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately, and they conspired with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. That last reading reminds us Jesus was, during his incarnate lifetime, derided and opposed by the religious leaders of Israel who were alarmed by what they regarded as his radical, even heretical, take on the Sinai law. It should not surprise us, then, that during what St. Matthew reports as his first formal teaching event delivered ex cathedra, his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus responded to their accusations, reminding his disciples that he had not come to abolish the law of Moses, from which he added, not an iota, not one dot will pass until all is accomplished, but that he had come to fulfill the law of Moses. Now remember, Jesus is speaking to a small group of men who had only recently been called by him and we're very likely still learning. This bit about his fulfilling the law must have been heady stuff. But before they could ask him what fulfilling the law actually meant, he added this. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
more righteous than the uber-righteous Pharisees? His disciples must have wondered, how is such a thing even possible? Michael Wilkins in his commentary offers this. If the scribes and Pharisees had not gained entrance, what hope was there for anyone else? Does Jesus mean an intensification of the doctrine of salvation by works? Does he mean that one must exceed the scribes and Pharisees in performing the commandments and to do them one better? No, his disciples are called to a different kind, a different quality of righteousness, not an increased quantity. Righteousness and the preaching of Jesus is not the personal attainment of ethical purity. Righteousness belongs in the realm of grace, operating from the inside out, not from the outside. And Jesus calls his disciples, he called them then, and he calls them now, to a better righteousness. A better righteousness, surely, than the legalism righteousness of the Pharisees or whatever religious group you want to identify. In Matthew 5, 21 to 48, Jesus will challenge his disciples to rethink six highly regarded ethical principles addressed by the, the Sinai law. He will introduce each one with this phrase. You have heard it said. He will then continue with the phrase, but I say to you, and then he will conclude by offering an explanation of how this ethical principle is brought to full essence in the kingdom of heaven. Brought to a place of better righteousness than just obeying the law. When Jesus adds, I say to you, he is establishing his authority over scripture. Just like he said, I am the master of the Sabbath to the Pharisees who complained in the grain fields. Jesus is now informing an established understanding of a well-known truth. And when he does that, he is speaking out of his own authority. We shouldn't be surprised that people, when they heard Jesus, he said, he's, he's so different. He, he doesn't teach like the scribes. He doesn't just repeat the things we've heard. He teaches like one who has his own authority. One of the things Jesus wants his disciples to rethink is murder. Let's pray. We too, Father, want to learn what we need to rethink. Many of us have our minds made up about far too many things, about far too many people. Many of us, Father, voice the opinions of those around us who speak loudly and sometimes drown out what we know your word says. Help us, Father, not to fall into that trap. And Lord, show us how to move to a place of better righteousness by your grace and for your glory. Open our minds and our hearts, Father. We seek to be transformed. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 21. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. When we read words like that, we kind of distance ourselves. Maybe we turn our brains off because I'm not going to murder anybody. 
crimes to murder anybody, Lord. And you know what? I might disagree with people, but I don't, when you get right down to it, I don't really actually hate anyone. And so Jesus wants us, wants you to rethink that. He does not seek to overturn or qualify the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, which better translated is thou shalt not murder. The Pharisees and the scribes and all the people of Israel understood that murder was a sin forbidden by God and that murderers should be punished and the scripture said they should be punished by death. Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds man's blood, by men his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. It's not about vengeance or retribution or correction. It's because it's an affront to God's creation. And you can argue that to the cows. I'm going to do it today. But Jesus is saying something that they all agree with. Okay, that even the, the Mosaic Law and the Pharisaic Law, they, we agree with that. But then Jesus says, but I say to you, just because you haven't committed suicide, come on, committed homicide, does not mean that you are obeying God. Because if you hate someone, you are committing murder. Committing murder. Now, come on, really? It's so hyperbolic, we don't, we kind of turn our heads off when we hear that. I tell you, Jesus said, if you are angry with someone, you have, in the eyes of God, committed a sinful act every bit as heinous and dangerous as murder. We don't believe that. We just don't believe that. We refuse to believe that. We, it's better to hate someone than to kill them, isn't it? Well, Jesus says no. Now, we have to rethink that. We live in a world that is so filled with the language of of hate spoken in anger through gritted teeth um, and bunched up faces turning red as they and this is people on both sides of every aisle folks, who say things that Jesus says have not to work. Well, we say those things because we don't believe it is murder. Well, Jesus says it is. He calls disciples into living by the rules of the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no place for anger at someone else for personal reasons. There's no room for it. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no room for hatred. Oh, you can hate sin, sure, but you have to love the sinner. That's so hard for us, we really just hate everything. The sinner and the sin. Jesus goes on in chapter 5. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Apparently, now we don't know what Raka means exactly. I mean, I think it means this. When you call someone an idiot and you mean it, I think that you're calling it Raka. But I think this, is, this seems to be a legal matter. Uh, in the time of Jesus, to say something like that was to lay a charge at someone's feet, a false charge. Because it dragged them into court. But I want you to rethink now anger. And I want you to rethink hatred. Because most of us have made some kind of a peace with being angry and hateful. Well, they deserve it. Oh, we all got it. It is the way these things are said and the heart from which these things spring. It is derision and contempt which Jesus is challenging here. To hate someone in the way Jesus means is to hold them in contempt. That is a complete that is a completely non-Christian emotion. There's no room for contempt in the kingdom. 
and the TV screens are rife with contempt, both sides. If you don't agree with me in this thing, I hold you in contempt. I not only mock you, I not only disagree with you, I hold you in contempt. You are an idiot. You must be a fool. Jesus bumps that into the crime of murder. You're not going to jail for it. But it will affect the way you live as a Christian. And Jesus goes on to say how. Verse 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Now we preach from that passage many times, and you know it by heart probably. Jesus is saying, if you're going to drag your resentment and your contempt for others into the sanctuary, please don't bother. This will impugn the reality of your worship. It will reduce your worshipful words and worshipful songs that you're singing to worthlessness. If you are singing these praises or offering these prayers when you're carrying around with you some resentment against someone. Now, is this, is Jesus being here just resentment against other Christians? I think not. Because Jesus said, and they'll say later, I say love me. Love cannot be expressed through contempt. No matter how right you think you might be. No matter how wrong your enemies might be. The essential mark of a Christian book of love you know, is love. And love is expressed in humility. <coughs> and in affection. And in sympathy. And in kindness. Even to your enemies. It is where Christians most often fail our Lord. Is our, his, our not believing that hatred and derision and contempt expressed as hatred, how they are so far removed from God's will for us and for His church. And I, I've seen pictures, you have too, of Christians, maybe, maybe official Christians, you know, seminary grads with degrees who uh, spout stuff on the TVs, TV screen that are so hateful and so contemptuous. And, you know, sometimes I hear Christians in the background say, yeah, tell them, say it. No, 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 don't say it. But this is where Jesus starts his antithetical teaching on the Pharisaic law. I want you folks, if you want to be my disciples, since you've been called to follow me, I want you folks to rethink a few things. Don't forget, this is after Jesus first called these people. This is like discipleship 101. First of all, rethink murder. Rethink murder, I got that on. I got that down. Don't kill anybody. Sixth commandment, I get that. No. Jesus says, I say to you, there's a lot more to it than that. Because if you are angry with someone, if you hate someone, if you are der derisive and contemptuous of someone, the eyes of heaven, you have crossed the line in taking a life. It sounds hard to believe, but that's where Jesus says discipleship begins. Later on, he will say, by this, all men shall know you're my disciples, that you love one another. Now, Jesus lays out another instance. If you come into the sanctuary with murder in your heart, uh, and you want to make an offering to God, stop. Go fix the situation. Now, if it's a friend, you must go talk to that friend and ask forgiveness. <clears throat> if it's a group that you kind of hate, throw the TV screen, I think you just need to sit in the back pew of the church and pray and ask God's forgiveness. Be reconciled to God in this matter, and then come and bring your gift to the altar. We kind of like to hold on to our contempt. It sort of fuels us. 
Uh, and uh, it is so completely non-Christian. It's the hardest thing. I think Shefferson said the hardest thing in God's belief is that you matter, everyone matters. I think the hardest thing in the world to believe is that God wants us to love our enemies. Not just to put up with them. Not just to not insult them, but to love them. We'd rather not. And here we are, discipleship 101. The second issue is uh, kind of a legal manner. If you are at odds with someone legally, I know of Christians who are in this situation also. Well, they're good Christians and they, they tithe faithfully, but actually they're into this credit card company or into this person for some serious dough. It's their way behind. I think Jesus would rather you withhold your tithe check, church, and take care of that first. What are you saying here? Settle with your adversary quickly. Jesus wants those who follow him to look as much like him as possible. To be humble and loving and to get your ducks in a row to the glory of God. Every Christian needs to respond to this teaching with great care. Now what, in your agenda right now, I wonder church, do you have to rethink and Jesus looks at you and says, no man or woman who has been called to follow me as a disciple, who calls himself or herself a Christian, who has been anointed by the Holy Spirit, who is being transformed by the renewing of his or her mind, should express contempt for anyone. So in Colossians 3, we'll close with this. Colossians 3, I'll read this reflection comment from the notes. Jesus began this lesson by stating something which was equally true under both Mosaic and Pharisaic law. Murder is forbidden. Murderers will be brought to judgment. And that sort of collect, help, helps us understand the limitations of the, of the law. The law can only dictate punishment. It can only name sin and dictate punishment for that sin. The law cannot change your mind. It cannot change your heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Jesus isn't really teaching a lesson about murder in this text. You probably figured that out already. He's not really talking about murder. What our Lord wants Christians to do is to rethink, to think Christianly about, if you will, anger. And he wants us to rethink anger too. All the way down to its essential components, hatred and contempt. Which, he says, in the eyes of God are sins just as desperate and despicable as the act of murder. These are among the rebellious acts which all Christians have been called by Christ to throw off. Well, gee, I thought Jesus just wanted me to quit smoking or quit drinking. Jesus wants you to tear down the strongholds that have defined you for a long time. Your attitudes, your opinions, your dislike of this or that person. Your attack dog mentality when someone crosses one of your imaginary lines, politically or religiously or socially. And they'll be crossed because the kingdom of heaven is totally unlike the kingdom of man. And so our lines will be crossed continually. And we must stand what the Bible says is true without being contemptuous of those who say no. So Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. Therefore, because of this, Paul writes elsewhere, put to death your members which are on the earth. We're familiar with this part. Paul tells us you've got to bring your body into submission to Christ's lordship. You've got to behave yourself. Put to death fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Which is idolatry, because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived, with them, lived in them way before you became a Christian. Now you yourselves are to put off these. Ready? You might make a checklist here. Anger. Wrath. Blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man 
with his deeds and had put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That's why we come to church every Sunday, to be renewed and re-renewed from God's word. We've got to have our, our, our excesses addressed and checked every so often. Because we begin to think our righteousness is so holy that it's good. Our anger is so holy that it's good. It is not. And so this is going to require serious work for some of us. Some of us. Because the things I despise, I got lined up pretty clearly. And when a certain face shows up on television, yeah, my first response is, oh, great. And you know what? The Lord is saying, ah, what? Lord, show me how to love that person. It's like trembling, shaking, tear, sticking up. Help me to love that person who's saying these things. Show me how to do that. Show me how to glorify you in my disagreements, in my own opinion. Show me how to do that in a way that glorifies you and doesn't just satisfy my thirst for blood. This is what we're going up, folks. And Jesus will take us into five more areas that are extremely close to the surface. This is where discipleship begins. Your mind is changed. Your heart is changed. And your acts will be changed. But you've got to start at the beginning. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Well, Father, we all stand guilty before you this morning. Uh, guilty, Father, of being angry. Not just with sin, but as sinners. We stand guilty of being saying hateful things about people that we don't like to ourselves or to others. We all are guilty, Father, of applauding when someone we don't like gets in the neck, of wishing awful things on bad people. Lord, we're, we're just a mess when it comes to this. You've, you've got us all in your sights, dear Father. We're all guilty. We don't want to writhe and, and Grimace, Father, we want to be changed. We want to glorify you in our lives. We say this almost every week. And particularly now, Father, as we go to the table of the Lord and share communion, remind us, Lord, that we are celebrating your death on the cross where you said, Father, forgive them, the people who were not only disagreeing with our Lord, but putting him to physical death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, that's that would be my prayer, Father, on so many occasions. So, Lord, may you be with us now as we move to this fellowship table, as we share, as we have communion with the body and blood of our Lord, who is sacrificed on the cross because he loves sinners. Keep us mindful, Father, of what's going on. Keep us aware of our need to rethink how we think. To rethink these things in accordance with your will and your word. We offer these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. I get out of the